Thanks, everybody, for tuning back in. We're back. Yes, uh, thank you, everybody. I have the lyrics to Get Low in my head right now. Is this good? Yep. Okay. So I wanted to remind everybody again about uh, the, the next uh, couple days seminars that we're having. Tomorrow is uh, <coughs> my seminar structure. And uh, that'll be an all-day large-scale project, in, uh, including both biomech and sort of uh, an iconic element. And uh, this is going to be all about, you know, any any kind of tattooing that you're going to do, any style. There's there's a need to make your piece strong, clear, readable, and all that. And um, this is something that's been on my mind a lot lately. The the idea of uh, how are you expressing your your structure and, and how can you make it stronger and so uh yeah that'll that'll be an all-day thing and this is going to be a lot more technical i'm going to be talking a lot more about things like you know your actual hand movements and types of machines and everything that you're using you know we're not really talking about that much now because this is open to the public and then um the day after that is going to be jeff's webinar size doesn't matter and it's going to be a small project, a hand piece. That's fine. This could be on me, for obvious reasons. I'm kind of excited about this one. And uh, I think he's going to be uh, pretty much demonstrating the whole project, beginning to end, uh, you know, layout and putting the design together and uh, tattooing it. These uh, webinars are for pro professionals only. Uh, and those who tune in, we welcome your most technical questions. Uh, you can get tickets for these at tattooeducation.com. Or uh, I think there is a link right there on your, uh, your screen at uh, Tattoo Now TV where you can register. But we've really been appreciating all of your, uh, your questions and feedback so far. Keep it coming. might be a slight adjustment period for you to get back into the groove. Yeah. <coughs> so Jeff had left this rock um, untouched so that I could lay it out mag first like I did with the uh, rocks up top. And I left the waves up there untouched so you could get back into those and uh, try to just keep the look of the top and bottom of the, the piece nice and consistent. So Jeff, I was thinking maybe after uh, you've laid everything out and uh, all parts of the piece have kind of got the equal treatment and we're ready to go in and start layering color or whatever, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, how would you like to uh, trade machines for a little bit? 
Yes. I'm down. I'd like to hear what you think of these. It looks cool. I really like where tattooing is as far as people wanting to make good tools and make good products. And it's, I think it's easy for people to be cynical and think that um, everyone's just out to make, to cash in on the trend right. and make money. But I think that it's just the popularity of it is and the, um, the competitiveness of the business of tattooing is kind of demanding quality. Yeah. So really, we're the ones that win in the end because we're getting better tools to to do our trade with. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty awesome. Well, it's been liberating because <coughs> now you've got people who've got really strong art skills that don't have to be nearly as hampered by learning this um, difficult technical process, you know, this right. um, trying to make these Victorian era, era technology, you know, Thomas Edison era stuff, uh, cooperate. Right. Which, uh, you know, I mean, I've got coil machines that I really, uh, you know, love that yeah, me too. I've done many great tattoos with and the invention of this new stuff doesn't necessarily change that, but I, I applaud the process of just making things better in general. Right. And the people who are making coil machines are making them better and better too. There's, yeah. there's just a, there's a lot more communication, you know, they, they understand things like frame geometry and, and that sort of thing uh, more universally, I think. Right. Hypercast we're doing is going to be about um, art degrees in the tattoo world. Really? And uh, so we're, we're having uh, Chris Dangwell, uh, Teresa Sharp, and uh, Kim Reed. Nice. And when we were uh, interviewing Chuck Eldridge, he was talking about how you know one of the big changes is that now tattooing is a place where art school graduates are often going straight to, you know. Right. It's become a, an attractive destination for somebody coming out of art school instead of going and playing the whole gallery game. Right. So that's been a big, big game changer. So any good questions rolling in? What what is the best po uh, advice? Okay, so let me try to word this right. Could you uh, could you ask Jeff and Guy what the best advice would be for an apprentice just starting off who is super dedicated to improving as much as possible with designs? Well, you know, a lot of it is just about quantity. You know, I mean do a whole bunch of art, you know, uh, do drawings that are intended to work well as tattoos, uh, lots and lots of them. Make it, make it a habit, you know, where you're, 
not just drawing for when you have a client or whatever. Um, you know, you're sitting with your friends in the bar, you're doing finger waves on the napkins, you know. It becomes a, a habit um, to just be, I don't know, integrate your art more directly into your, your life at every level. That should, you know, I mean, it's not a, a, a thing to do. It's, it's a whole lifestyle kind of dedication thing. Um, but, you know, it pays off. And, and really, if, if you're passionate about what you're doing, what better way is there to be spending your time? And, uh, you know, every week of really hardcore dedicated drawing, you're going to see improvement in what you're doing. You're going to think of ideas based on how your drawings are already evolving. You're going to get positive feedback from people you show the work to, and that can be very inspiring towards, you know, not just moving forward with the stuff you're drawing, but, you know, maybe helping to recognize where you're succeeding the most, you know, the stuff that people respond to the most strongly. Often that's, that's a good place to apply more pressure, you know, if you're trying to develop a, a style that's more, you know, universally appealing or whatever. I think that I would say that to be patient, you know, and, and know that the world isn't going to pass you by and you're not going to miss out, like, there's going to be generations of tattooers that come after you, after us, and it's not like you're going to miss it, you know, you didn't start too late or whatever, it just is what it is, <coughs> you're where you're at. I think that I, I spent so many years <coughs> worrying that I was going to be left behind and that was a lot of uh, undue stress, you know, it's like just accept where you're at and do your best and keep going. Yeah, have faith in the thing. I mean, this, if this is what you've chosen to put your, uh, your life's energy into, have faith that it'll work out, that your, your hard work will pay off. And then just keep at it. Here's a hey, can I ask a favor of you? Yeah. Can you glove up and move the garbage can over here? <clears throat> so how do you guys find down. time? Oops, sorry. Thank you. How do you guys find time to be dedicated to your work plus have a family? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the million dollar question. You know? Nothing's more important than your art. Nothing's more important than your family. I don't really know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, that's a... I ask that question and I get asked that question every single year. You know, do better at your art and you'll make a better living and feed your family with, or whatever, you know, I mean, that's, that's a... Uh, a very real thing. It also can be an excuse to spend less time with the family if you're not careful. I found that mine, you know, my uh, my time seems to go back and forth where, you know, you can spend too much time trying to relax and too much time off and you can spend too much time working and you know when things get out of balance, you know, you can't spend every day just partying and relaxing and you can't spend every day and every waking moment just working because something's going to give. <clears throat> so I, go, I seem to go through waves where I'll book too many shows, I'll work too many hours and then it breaks and then I have to pull back, you know, and focus on my home time and vice versa, you know. But it's a constant working towards balance. Yeah, I don't know if there's a actual state of finding that balance. No. You 
you know, one, one thing that, it's not, not always easy to do this, but some people have successfully made it happen, is you can sometimes combine art time and family time. You know, you're all sitting around watching a movie in the evening. You can have your sketchbook in your lap, and sometimes your, your kids might pick up on that and choose to, you know, use their time creatively while, while mom and dad are sitting around drawing. Um, you know, they have to be past a certain age, obviously, before you can do that, but uh, it's worth trying. Yes, that's technical. So we're going to be going into detail about that uh, tomorrow and Tuesday. Um, yeah, we're going to be getting a, a whole lot more technical. So please tune in. That's that's going to be an educational opportunity that uh, you know, two very different projects that um, are going to give you a pretty pretty full spectrum of uh, traditional and modern techniques. And uh, yeah, Jeff and I are both using uh, rotaries a lot of the time, different machines for different reasons, and we'd love to go in it, uh, into it in detail. But right now is not the time and place. But the next couple day uh, seminars are for professionals only. Might as well also mention uh, in April, right before uh, Hell City, um, I'll be having a, a two-day reinventing the tattoo web, uh, webinar, which uh, is also you know available to uh, live uh, participants if you if you want to actually show up at our uh, undisclosed location in uh, the middle of nowhere, Illinois. And that's, uh, that's going to be covering the whole reinventing the tattoo curriculum, which you know is very design oriented. Uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, the what, what I think are the important fundamentals uh, of tattoo design. Um, you know things like contrast and flow and lighting and all these other uh, basic artistic understandings that. Uh, you know, are not just about tattooing, they're, they're about composition. And then uh, day two is about applying that as, a, as an artist. And uh, it's going to be a limited uh, attendance seminar because all participants, whether uh, it be in person or uh, online, uh, will be submitting portfolio pieces and I'll be doing uh, critiques of those as part of the seminar. And in those critiques, I actually Photoshop the stuff. And, you know, try to really demonstrate ways of, of improving what you're doing. Um, how often do you draw for yourself, not for a client? Um, I, uh, I have all these painting ideas that I uh, do very rough sketches for and just kind of file them on a shelf in the back of my mind hoping I'll get to them. Um, and, uh, you know, in the course of, like, for instance, the Biomech Encyclopedia project, did a lot of just drawing for drawing's sake. A lot of stuff I didn't even end up using and it. it was just a, a period where I was just trying to bust out a lot of it to uh, expand my vocabulary. Um, but, you know, I, I have to admit that I don't know enough s just sitting down and doing a drawing because I'd like to see this drawing get done. And, uh, you know, I have every, every excuse about being too busy and that kind of thing. 
which is all true, of course, but uh, you're never past a point where you can benefit from doing extra drawings. One thing I definitely do, though, is when I'm drawing for new projects, I tend to do a number of drawings that I don't even use, you know. I'll uh, do a couple, three thumbnails, and then, you know, when I'm past that point, I, I might even do a couple of finished drawings before, you know, the first one might be nice, but it's just not what I wanted to draw, you know, and so, you know, it's still a good experience, and I may end up actually using it for something else <laughs> later, but I still have to try to accomplish the initial vision that I had. And so, you know, that's kind of drawing for drawing's sake to a certain extent. But it's, it's uh, drawing for the sake of trying to expand your vision and uh, not just settle for the, the first thing that comes out of your head. Let's see what else might be in there if you take your idea and probe it a little deeper. Or sometimes just that act of taking that vision, because, you know, you might actually have a pretty concrete vision. And, you know, the act of taking that and trying to coax a little bit of it across that boundary of your imagination onto paper successfully, you know, because it's such a delicate thing, you lose so much in the translation. I've wanted to draw for years, but I haven't taken the time. <coughs> because, <coughs> like I said before, I'm overcommitted. I've overcommitted myself. It's no, you know, I'm the only one responsible for that. And uh, so every time I sit down to draw, there's always a list of things that I need to draw for. So I, I regretfully have kind of created an, a world where I don't have, I haven't made the time to do that. And uh, I really wish that, I hope that I can make some adjustments and get that back in my life somehow. I try to, you know, you use your projects as places to try new ideas, but you're not going to take the risks that you would if you were doing it just for the sake of doing art. Right. It's right. kind of like, um, when I used to play music, you know, everything I did was was to be heard, and uh, it's the only time you really take risks is when you're playing by yourself, and it doesn't matter who's listening because no one's listening. And uh, I need to I need to get that back in my life somehow, but it's going to take time because I have a lot of momentum with uh, over commit over committing. Which, you know, I mean, even in that kind of circumstance, you can still use it to push yourself artistically. But you're right. Uh, you know that there's going to be a certain expectations of each project. Yeah. You know, it's a poster for a convention or whatever. Yeah, it's always you, something. You need it to serve a certain purpose the right way. Right. I like the piece you got on the easel in the back there, the snake. Thanks. That was for, that's for the Rockstar, the Solon Rockstar energy drink contest. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, even though it's for something, it's yeah. still a really nice piece of art. I'm happy with it. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, posted next week. I like, It's. it was a new process that um, I just kind of, ended up on because my oil painting wasn't turning out right and the, the deadline was crunching down on me so I had to come up with a new kind of a new process that I could get done in the time frame I had and I very luckily found a really cool process and I love it. <coughs> I want to do more. So I posted a teaser of the piece that I threw away. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I remember Michelle showed it. I didn't it throw there. it away, but I definitely abandoned it because it wasn't working. The thing I liked about that one was the way that 
um, you know, you'd kind of tinted the whole surface a little bit, except yeah. for a couple key areas that just made those areas glow, you know. I really love, especially with oil paints or anything um, on canvas, you know, exploring the idea of transparencies, which is the one thing that you can't get with tattooing. So I think that's why it always kind of intrigues me. You can kind of mimic it in tattooing though. In some ways you... Yeah, you, you can put layers of color yeah. that overlap. But they're not, uh, you're not able to put actual space between those layers. Yeah, you're not gonna have light travel through it and back at your eye. Bouncing around inside uh, a layer of gloss medium or whatever. Yeah. Here's another one. Uh, what are your thoughts on going back to art school after many years of tattooing? And then uh, uh, as a follow-up, what, if any, courses have Guy and Jeff taken? Illustration, life drawing? I've only taken uh, a weekly figure drawing class at, a, at Southern Oregon Art Academy a few, like six years ago. And it was uh, invaluable. Um, I don't think you can ever go wrong with learning something. Figure drawing is a great practice. Actually, before we became parents, Michelle and I went to do this all-day figure drawing workshop a couple times a year, just to sort of stay in the game. And it's not just about drawing people, you know, although it is nice to be able to do that. Even for somebody like me who doesn't ordinarily tattoo figures, I do sometimes, but it's, it's about, you know, you, you learn more about natural flow and uh, form and space and that kind of thing, but it's really also about observation, about learning to right. see differently, about uh, being able to understand and capture proportion and tricky foreshortening problems. There's just a lot of good skills you can learn from it. I mean, like for me, I, uh, I like to try to get the basic figure nailed in the first half of the sitting and then spend the rest of the time doing surface modeling, trying to get all the subtle lighting. <clears throat> That's what I learned from it, was just that coordination between your mind, your hand, and the execution of it. So just getting accurate um, was something that's, it just comes with practice, yeah. so. I would always try to make the point if we, you know, during the all day session, at least doing one uh, portrait, you know, where I just focused on the face. And I do a few that were just hands or just feet. I tend to um, do a lot of close crops. Because, you know, I'm trying to learn more about uh, organic modeling, you know, the, the tricks for making a 3D modeled organic surface look more convincing and right. uh, more natural. And then I can use that in the kind of stuff that I do. So even though I'm not taking these skills back into a realistic figure tattooing context, there's still skills that benefit what I'm doing very, you know, immediately. Plus it's just enjoyable, you know. I mean, one of the great things about figure drawing is if you do it regularly, you will see steady improvement every week. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, that if, if you're trying to develop artistically, there's, there's nothing like having some really concrete way of being able to measure your own progress. I've never taken any other classes. Yeah, I took also some, uh, my sister and I took some figure drawing classes that were sponsored by the Art Institute. They were, uh, this is right as I was finishing up high school, so it was a long, long time ago. And then, you know, Michelle and I picked it back up <coughs> a, uh, again a long time after that. And, uh, you know, those skills stay with you. You do remember it.
when uh, you're working on a tattoo collector and you're putting pieces next to other great artists, do you feel any extra pressure? Um, I always like working on people who already have really nice collections. I, I feel flattered that they want to have my work in this really nice collection, you know. Um, I don't really get any additional pressure from it because I always, like under every circumstance and every tattoo, I just try to do the very best I can do and I, I know that I can't do any better than that. So, you know. Yeah, as long as you're giving your all. There's, there's not, there's not going to be a project where I'm not going to try to be on my A game, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's flattering, you know. I, I definitely like, I, 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 I'd say I feel more inspired, you know, uh, in a case like that, uh, because I get to be part of this really nice tattoo collection with these people's work that I really admire, and uh, you know, I kind of pick up a little bit of vibe off of that. Is that what everyone's seen right there? Just a picture? Yeah, it's frozen. Yeah, that's not what I'm seeing. You sure about that? It's okay. Like All right. Okay. I hear everything like 10 minutes or like 3 minutes after. Like yeah, that's after that. Oh. So yeah, I'm putting in some organic sort of textury stuff on this rock, layering all these uh, different kind of dull blues and browns and uh, grays, a little bit of purple on top of all that. Being mindful not to bring any of this color into the background where there isn't rock, because we're trying to keep all of that pure black and gray. I think for me, as far as back to that question about collectors and stuff, it's it's always an honor, you know. I mean, there are a million tattooers out there, and there are so many good people now, known and unknown. And so, to me, I don't ever take it lightly when someone asks me to tattoo them, and I never take it with any sort of expectations. So, to me, it's always a, an honor because there's so many other people they could choose. And when it's someone that <clears throat> has an understanding of what they could be getting, and they choose me anyways, I'm gonna give it my all. And I'm not gonna say it's not weird when you're tattooing next to Philip Lupis or, you know, it's just like, what can you do but try hard, you <laughs> know? Yeah. Yeah, they don't go away. I mean, a few people have died, but... You know, I've actually had a chance to rework some large old stuff uh, more recently. And of course, you know, I can't correct the design flaws, you know. But they're sort of fun, you know. It's kind of a blast from the past coloring book project. And, you know, putting a new polish on it is kind of nice because they've worn the piece for 25 years or whatever. And it's like, okay, we'll give you another 25 of it looking, you know, still readable. Some of the stuff from back then has actually held up pretty well. The bigger stuff, you know, because it was done big enough that it can survive the ravages a little bit better. Oh, plenty of them. But, you know, I knew what I was thinking at the time with all of them. And, uh, yeah, I have seven years of those. No. Everyone has that. It's just... It's just tattooing, you know, it's the progression. But more, more than what the hell was I thinking, it's, it's more of an attitude of, thank God I'm not doing that anymore, you know? Or, you know, just more of a sense of recognizing that at the time, I mean, I, I, I've always known at any point in my career that the way that I tattoo is not the be all end all, that I can continue to improve it, you know? At the time, I couldn't imagine what the, those things necessarily would be, you know, it was still in my future. And so, I have to remind myself that that's still the case now. There's big improvements still to come, and I don't know what they're going to be yet.
but I should look forward to them, you know? Never get too comfortable with how you're doing things right now at this moment. I look forward to those, those new understandings. <clears throat> After collaborations, do you find yourself trying a lot of new things that you saw the other guy using? Like machines or techniques? Sometimes, you know. And if I, uh, I mean, I'm going to hopefully get a chance to try out Jeff's machine in a little bit. I haven't done uh, very many collaborations, but anytime I open my eyes up to what other people are doing, it, it does affect my work. And uh, I've always guarded myself and tried to not look so much at people's work because I've always, I've always uh, strived to be somewhat original, um, even though I've done my share of, you know, ripping people off and copying. Um, but I've always seen it as kind of, you know, it's like that, that is a compliment. You know, you like their work and you imitate it and you role model it. <clears throat> That's different than taking credit for it. I have a lot of people that uh, imitate some of the stuff I do and I never really take offense to it. The only time it seems somewhat offensive is if someone takes credit for it. You know, and that's, that's really rare. Every once in a while someone will post a picture of my work and say they did it, and it's not even really worth acknowledging. It's just like, that's weird. Like, who, would, who does that? I've had my whole portfolio stolen before. It's crazy. Yeah, especially in the day of the internet when, yeah. you know, you've got an <clears throat> online portfolio, you've got apprentices in your shop, you're trying to pass off somebody else's work as your own. They're watching you do your work and it doesn't look like your portfolio at all. Yeah. It's one thing to be, to have someone do work that imitates you and you go, wow, if they like it that much. Yeah, an obvious influence. You know, the one, one way to avoid your work looking too much like the people you're influenced by is just don't look at their work while you're drawing. Look at it all you want, you know, but when you're actually drawing, just put it away. That way, the, the style that you're trying to absorb from them is going more through your filter. Yeah. And it'll end up being more original. And you might not like it as much, but you've got to take those steps. You've got to take your, some steps to distance yourself a little bit from your influences and start to make it your own. And that, that's going to involve stages where, you know, you wish it was better. And just stay at it. Try to absorb more influences. If you mix more influences rather than just having a couple of people who you're really into, you're more likely to find a blend that adds up to being something that's really your thing because you know, you've chosen all these different influences that are all you know, based on your own sensibilities and that's going to be part of where you build your, your style up. Some uh, tattooers are trying to get you guys to keep telling more stories so that there's less technical questions. Um, so maybe how about some uh, other stories of maybe uh, long power sessions or collaborations? Well, I mean, I've certainly had plenty of those. Uh, a lot of them with Don McDonald, uh, Mike Cole, Nick Baxter, uh, Michelle Wortman. Uh, few people I've collaborated with bunches of times. <clears throat> um, and a few people who, you know, just been a, a one or two quick projects that I still got a lot from because, I mean, like for instance, I got to do pieces, two pieces with uh, Robert Hernandez and uh, learned some stuff about rendering and highlighting just from these, these two projects that, uh, you know, I mean, I really admire how he pulls off these certain effects and it helped me to understand that a little bit better and then 
circle back and bring it into my own way of doing things and <coughs> you know strengthen my highlights <coughs> in my own way but based on understandings I learned from working with him. Robert Hernandez changed my life. Mm. So I was in, it was 2004, 2005 and, and so I've been tattooing about four or five years and my references are, were just magazines. And I would usually just look in the reader's gallery. I never really looked at the features too much. And uh, <clears throat> so I go to the, the Vegas convention and I'm walking down the aisle and um, <clears throat> Corey Norris walks by and he was working on my sleeve at the time. And he says, hey, have you seen Robert Hernandez, his work? And uh, I had only seen his face on the on the website and he had he had long hair at the time he was like making a metal face and I thought is that the crazy guy the main crazy guy on the website and uh, he said yeah go check it out so I went around the corner and my client was with me and I was getting ready to do an Emmett Kelly portrait my first portrait in color and um, we walked over and we flipped I flipped through his portfolio and I could not believe it. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I had never seen tattoos like that. And I'm, I'm looking at it, just flipping the pages in awe. I get to the end and my client, who is like a foot taller than me, which is like everyone, he just elbows me and he's like, can you do that? <laughs> and I looked at him and I'm like, uh, I can try. I don't know. I, I didn't know we were able to do this. <laughs> I really didn't know. I was just like, yeah. I don't know. And we walked over and I did uh, the best tattoo I'd ever done. And mm. that tattoo won best of show. What My was the first piece? best of show, it was an Emmett Kelly portrait. Okay, so you just, you just changed your approach to it after seeing Robert's work. Yeah, it changed everything. It was my first big award and I had won like some little awards, you know, but uh, my first best of show and my tattoos never, uh, they just changed from then on. Yeah, like five times, pretty much every time I see him. Yeah, like the third time I was, I was in Italy and I walked up, he was having breakfast with his wife and I'm all, Robert, um, you changed my life. And he's all, he just kind of nods like, yeah, I know. Um, again, this again. Like, no, you don't understand, man. <laughs> like, I was in Vegas. Yeah, I got to tell him. And then I got to take my daughter and she got her first tattoo by him ah. on like a month before her 18th birthday. And it was a very, it was like the, what do they call that, a pilgrimage. We made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And, uh, yeah, it was just, anywho, you want some back team? We spent a lot of time with references when we were drawing up the crab, um, kind of mixing and matching uh, different aspects of uh, different photos. And, you know, I mean, we had no desire to take any one reference and blow it up and trace it and, you know, do that whole thing. We just wanted to make sure that the anatomy of the crab was accurate and that the way that we were incorporating the face was a, a good mix of um, being realistic with it because these, <coughs> these crabs really do have this uncanny <coughs> face pattern in them and also being kind of stylized with it and having a little fun with the expression and all that. Um, but yeah, having all those references in front of us was hugely helpful. But we got far enough with the drawing and, you know, had enough information in the stencil that there was no, no need to print up the, photo, the reference photos and bring them out, you know, we're just working straight from the drawing. Yeah, I've made a conscious effort to kind of break down the word reference to refer to something. And then I, I just see it as like you look at it and then you look away and you take an influence from it. So 
we did refer to a bunch of pictures and there was some Japanese wood blocks. I looked at a couple tattoos. We looked at a bunch of pictures of these crabs and then we looked at uh, a couple like, what are they, what are those? They're illustrations, like technical illustrations. Right, the anatomy right. like style. Very careful anatomical illustrations of them. So yeah, both, both a stylized and um, uh, kind of scientific representations of the crab. And um, you know, we looked at one depiction that was sort of an old wood block uh, image of one of these crabs. Are we able to move his arm out a little? Yeah. Are you able? Would this, would this be a good Yeah, do you want the pillow under it a little bit? Oh, maybe I'll just support this right under there. Let's get it. Uh, I think I'm good right now. No, uh, actually I guess a sip of water while well, it's right over there. Oh, well, we're kind of stopping here for a second. You know, I wasn't joking about ordering pizza. Maybe we should look into that. Anybody want in on this? Sure. Um, who do we talk to about, about getting that process rolling? Oh, uh, well, I'd like a veggie pizza of some sort. You know, it could be what, let's say, olives, peppers, uh, tomatoes, uh, and plain cheese is always a winner. And then maybe get a pepperoni. Um, we got, uh, I guess, make them all big. I don't know if we need a fourth one too. They'll probably all get eaten. Could someone bring me a glass of water? I'm all wired up. How you doing, man? I'm good, yeah. Mm. It's uh, really an honor getting this. So thank you. Both of you guys. So what's your plan now? Are you going to work in the middle? I was just going to shade it a little okay. here, but I didn't, I didn't know how far. Yeah, we're trying to get there, too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we've got all that stuff. Um, as far as pace, you know, I was trying to pace through there, but I did, I was feeling a little like, oh, I don't know where to go. Well, I mean, I mean if you feel like doing any rendering in the crab, you're more than welcome to, you know. Um, I you wanted to do that with just color? Um, well, I mean, it's going to need a little bit more black. Okay. Hmm. Ah, thank you. Excellent. You know, the strongest black is in these eyebrow markings, but I think that especially as we get towards this side, away from the light source, a little bit more black uh, layered in there wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. Um, and I'm going to work these claws on down this here. side. Yeah. Okay. And then... Uh, I definitely I have more, more gray water I can work through there before I want to switch okay. gears. Okay. And then, you know, we'll have to turn them out a little bit more, but there's some fingers in here to... Yeah. And, you and know, what? the face down position isn't going get, to give you those either. Yeah. Are you ready for that? Um, are we doing, what's going on here? Are we going to um, do, is that coming out of that? I have no idea. Oh, yeah, that was going to be a rock up there of some sort. But now there's a bunch of pigment. I can't see what's going on. Well, it could. Uh, <clears throat> this could. Maybe it could have a, another arc coming across it. Mm. And if you want to go ahead and outline the rock, it doesn't have to be magged in, you know. It'll still ultimately look the same. <coughs> I can, I have a little mag out too. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Okay. Back can drop, I'm good to go. No Unfortunately, I'm going to be starting new areas. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, back team. Oh well. I'll try. I'll try a little.
One thing I'm really happy about with this uh, sleeve is I think we succeeded in not having a seam in the back, you know? Oh. I mean, of course, there's a place where the crab wasn't going to continue all the way around, you know? Right. But the rocks and the waves and everything else all connect really nicely. Nice. I know there's kind of a wall of water coming up, but it seems to have a nice flow to it. Hey, Ben or Matt or somebody, is there any way I could get a little bit of a light adjustment? Yeah, back at home, I've just got a pair of out lights that I keep off to either side. Pretty much just flood the whole tattoo, but it's right mm. up close, and sometimes, you know, you've got a lamp in your face. Yeah. Um, if it could be over my shoulder yep. a little bit more, that would be even better. That's very helpful. Thank you. So what do you guys look for in a good tattoo? What are the, what are the qualities of a tattoo that make it good? Well, there's a few different things. There's, there's drawing aspects. There's originality aspects. There's just impact. There's a leap out at you kind of aspects. There's technical things. You know, you can be really, really impressed by a piece that's not necessarily <coughs> super original, but it's just so amazingly well done. Um, but you know, when you see a tattoo where all those things are combined, something original about it, and you know, it looks great from a distance, flows amazingly well, knocked out of the park technically. You know, all of the above, if possible, you know. That's what you always want to aim for if you can. Yeah, I think that a lot of people are impressed by the difficulty, le level of difficulty or technical. And it's like, well, that looks really hard, you know. It doesn't mean it necessarily is like, wow, that's awesome. You know, just like a well-placed, well-done tattoo that's striking, you know. It's, or even subtle. That's one thing I've learned this last year in Japan um, was accepting subtleties in tattoos where I always had really just kind of gone for dynamics <clears throat> and it's a risky thing to go for subtleties you know to use neutral tones or soft edges or low contrast um, so <clears throat> Sometimes I look at those and it's like, wow, that's, that's, that was really bold and daring to be so subtle, if that makes sense. I like to find a, a balance, you know, where there's a lot of bold contrast in a piece, but then areas where subtleties are showcased, you know? Yeah. Often I'll have like large foreground shapes that, you know, they've got really dark shading behind them and uh, quarter inch outlines going around them. But then the rendering inside them, it might all be pretty subtle. Yeah. And uh, the colored schemes that I'll choose for them will often be um, mostly neutrals with just a couple of very carefully chosen vibrant colors. I think it's funny that, you know, people always kind of trash talk the trends. And so, you know, that 
that super simple handwritten script that's just really small mm -hmm. on her wrist or on ribs. Right. Everyone's like, oh man, that's so Pinterest. Well, I, I like it. I think it looks cool. Um, I mean, I've seen some that are crappy, but a lot of times it's a nice looking tattoo. Like it doesn't have to be epic. It can just be, you know, a simple signature looking thing. And uh, it's almost like they're so popular that everyone hates them, but there's a reason why they got popular is because it looks good. So. How do you feel about really popular tattoos? Um, you know, what do you the first person that had the idea of Danny Lai blowing away the birds probably thought that was pretty bad. You know? And then when it happens 200 times, why does it become so evil? How do you feel about that? I don't know. Well, if it's done 200 times really well, then maybe it's not a bad thing. If it's in, that means it's inspired 200 good tattoos. But if it's an idea that gets picked up and run with in all the wrong ways, um, then that's what makes for you know a cliche that people you know are going to start trash talking. And usually that's what's going to happen. You know, like the whole thing with tribal, for instance. You know, if you look at a well done tribal bodysuit that's you know got all the right influences uh, and everything and, and flows well and that kind of thing. It could be very, very striking, you know? But people saw that and they're like, yeah, man, I want a tribal wristband. Uh, you know, thinking it would have the same mojo somehow and it just doesn't. And, uh, you know, 20,000 tribal armbands and wristbands and tramp stamps later, um, you know, it, it's become mostly a cliche and a lot of people like to trash talk tribal and then there are a few people who really specialize it and respect it and, and uh, you know, kind of keep it alive because when done right at, at a large scale, it's, it's not cheesy or stupid, you know, not, not even remotely. Right. Any genre done right can be awesome. I mean, as soon as it's done right, you'll have a thousand people doing it wrong. But bit by bit, the, uh, the understandings grow. You know, there's actually a period where you really didn't see any large scale tribal, for instance. You know, it was something that pretty much just was cheesed out. And now all of a sudden, you got all these new variations of tribal that's combined with pointillism and things like this, you know, daring new blends. And, and it's cool, you know, because the, there's such a diversification happening. There's room for stuff like that now, stuff that's not trendy, but then it becomes its own little trend. There's uh, been a couple of questions about meditation. Either you two have any experience with meditation? I don't. Um, Not really. There's a certain kind of meditation that comes with things like bicycling or running or kayaking that, uh, you know, I've got plenty of experience with that and, and, you know, it's not exactly the same, but you accomplish some of the same things. And it changes your body chemistry and, and the way that you think and it gives you a sense of clarity that you might not normally have when you're just immersed in your normal day-to-day -day life. You know, your heart rate is different, and the oxygen in your brain is different. And, uh, and so it's, it's a form of medica meditation in a way. Medication, yeah, it's changing your body chemistry. Mm.